Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. A couple of days ago, I filmed a video called Canada's Record Wildfires. Smoke traveling thousands of miles is choking out many major cities. And then I followed that up with a second video called Cascading Feedbacks and the Science Behind the Dystopian Orange Skies in New York City. So these, there was basically this major smoke out event uh, last week where you know Canada's largest export to the U.S. was wildfire smoke and you know maybe it's uh, gonna wake some people up some politicians but that remains to be seen but I do want to follow up um, with another video which I'm doing right now on um, some of the uh, science behind the um, wildfires. There's a couple of reports that have uh, come out um, recently on wildfires in the U.S. in particular, and also on, you know, how we're going to expect a lot more events in a warmer, warmer world. And there's, you know, many obvious reasons for that, and I'll discuss some of them. I also really wanted to try to put it into a bit more perspective the how the, the the effect of the quality of this air people have been breathing and one of the ways to do that is to compare it to the number of cigarettes you'd smoke you'd smoke so you know i could also argue that you know if you're a heavy smoker then you don't need to worry about wildfire smoke because um you know what you're doing is is uh far worse than than now but the the point is is you have a choice to do that you know with the wildfire smoke you're in a city the city the city gets blanketed with smoke and you don't have a choice and also um everybody every person in the city to various degrees depending on how much they were indoors outdoors whether they masked up or whatever was exposed to significant smoke which you can then equate to a uh, number of cigarettes smoked so I'll talk about that in great detail and also the longevity question. Um, in the worst polluted um, cities in the world, the air quality is bad, bad enough to reduce the uh, lifespan of the average person in that city by about a decade or so. I think the global average is almost uh, two years um, reduction of life expectancy due to air pollution that they would breathe. That's the global average. I think it's a year and eight months or something like that. But, you know, there are cities, some cities in, in India, particularly that are far, far worse. So I'll, t I'll talk about that. And I think in the, also in China, I think in the worst city, it's equivalent to the air pollution that you get in a day is the equivalent to smoking about three packs of cigarettes. So I'm going to show the data where I get these numbers from um, in, in this video as a continuation of the previous two that I did on the um, wildfires. Okay, so yeah, so this is my YouTube channel. Um, you know, you can just Google me on YouTube. Um, to find it, or there's links to it from my website, uh, paulbeckwith.net. If you click on any of the videos, then it brings you to, the, to my YouTube channel. Please consider making a donation to PayPal to support my research and videos on my web, you know, and that's, you, you access the PayPal on my website, paulbeckwith.net. Okay, so um, these are the last two videos. Um, so let's uh, move on. And uh, just to give you sort of a heads up on what's in the pipes, after I do, after I do this fire video, which will be the third one, um, then I'm going to do a couple different things. I might do food next, because um, there's no research that suggests that wheat crops may be threatened by unprecedented heat and drought sooner than we think the potential for surprising heat and drought events in wheat producing regions of USA and China, big wheat producers, because um, there are thresholds of temperature and uh, 
dryness that we're rapidly approaching. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a couple videos on these papers and then I want to talk about the Arctic summer being practically sea ice free because this was big news last week just before the fires. Um, so I'll talk about some of the um, you know papers uh, on that but the Arctic Ocean being ice free um, by the 2030s maybe even within seven years according to the latest um, scientific research. So I'll talk about those findings as well. Okay, so let's talk about smoke again. So just to remind you, this is firesmoke.ca and it's running a loop, um, running a loop from today, um, you know, looping through um, and the time it's looping through each movement is one hour and it starts from the present time and it moves through. So there's still an enormous number of wildfires um, in, in, in Canada that are burning. Um, I think Edmonton has had the worst um, air pollution, uh, air quality, um, th th you know, now. And it's projected, you know, you can see these darker areas uh, hitting Calgary and also Edmonton, you know, being very intense in these regions. And uh, I'm here in Ottawa, so we've had pretty good air quality the last few days. Um, so this is, you know, but it, it uh, today was a little bit worse. We got some of this stuff covering us, but you can so you can see kind of the 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 motions here. There's still loads of fires going on. There's also lots of fires going on in the boreal forest in in Russia. Okay, in Siberia in particular, Siberia is having record heat waves, lots of fires there. And uh, there's not a lot of press coverage on it, but I'll show you some articles about that. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Okay, uh, so this is very useful to know this website, firesmoke.ca. You can just Google it and then play the you know current situation to sort of follow it and see you know, where your city is, whether you're going to be, whether you can be expected to have poor quality air um, in the next little while. Um, of course, this is a very useful map. This is the world, waqi.info, the world air quality, real time air quality index. So you can see, um, you don't see the reds or purples in North America like you did last week. Um, lots of them still in, you know, in, in many countries. So, um, this was in, uh, you know, India, you know, is just covered with, uh, places that have, you know, very unhealthy air quality. And I've seen some very startling, uh, numbers. Uh, here's one right here, for example, if I can try to click on it. 2387, it says in Uzgen, Kyrgyzstan. I don't know if, if that's valid or if that's a detector error. It was updated two minutes ago. I mean, that's that's crazy. Up here, there's another one, um, another place in Kazakhstan. Or was that the one I looked at? 2387, 2327, 2386. Well, they're different number. I mean, what's going on there? This is obviously industrial pollution. Um, it's, I could, um uh, just trying to 500 in turkey there i'm just looking at the worst ones in the world right now there's a 192 uh in south africa up here there's a couple of high ones mackenzie county so they, these are places where there must be fires very close to some of these sensors up in northern canada but we're not um you know, and that smoke is coming down into into uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. So this is a very useful map uh, website once again for air quality. Um, in Canada, you know, if you live in Ontario, there's excellent data. So I'm Ottawa downtown, and uh, so this was the event on June 6, where it peaked at about 267. The the PM 2.5 in micrograms per cubic meter. And then this was a very bad day, June 7th, um, when we reached 511 um, in the morning. Now, it, numbers are generally higher at night because of the 
whether the, because it gets colder at night, the air gets denser, you can have an inversion layer, you know, as the air near the ground cools off, the air is warmer aloft, you get it trapped basically, and then it can build up here. And then this is, um, it was very, very low for a couple days. You know, I'm talking about under five and uh, just today it was up a bit higher. Okay, um, and I showed you, you know, on the smoke map, why, I mean, we're getting some of the smoke, diffuse smoke over Ottawa. So you can, you can, you can check out uh, specific places. I believe um, uh, I read somewhere that um, Montreal is worst, um, but then in Ontario, uh, Windsor, Windsor is very bad in general, I was told. So let's look at Windsor. Yeah, so you can see Windsor, you know, um, Windsor's typically, this isn't from smoke, this is just Windsor, this is just pollution, it's probably coming across from the US. But you can see the numbers are generally quite a bit higher than, than Ottawa. Um, and I think Oshawa is another place. I had a look at that uh, where uh, the numbers are, the numbers are not great. Not sure what that spike was. Seems to be a spike near noon on a bunch of days in Oshawa. Okay, but the numbers are generally, you know, if there anything up here, it's not great. It's not great air quality. So anyway, if you live in Ontario, this is a very useful um, government of Ontario uh, site. Okay. In terms of, uh, you know, air quality, IQ Air is very useful. Um, right, I'll just update this. It says 72 as of uh, 8 p.m. Um, as of an hour and 20 minutes ago in Ottawa and it gives a breakdown which is nice so you can see the uh, PM 2.5 the ozone is you know quite high ground level ozone and NO2 now interestingly enough uh, a Berkeley study uh, came up with the number that 22 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5 is equivalent to smoking one cigarette and I'll get back to that. I'll show you how that's how they figured that out and what it means. So what it means for Ottawa uh, a few days ago, um, it meant about smoking 23 cigarettes for the day. Uh, but there's some places in in um, Russia and China and and uh, India from time to time where it's like smoking uh, uh, about. Uh, you know, 60 to 70 cigarettes a day. So about, I think there's still 24 cigarettes in a pack. Maybe they've reduced that to 20 with shrinkflation, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's like three packs a day if it's uh, 20 to 20, 24 cigarettes in a pack. So this is a very useful site. And this is uh, this is around the world, this site. You can use IQ Air to get your, um, to get your air quality and the forecasts um, in your, uh, in your city where you are. Um, okay, um, of course, this is the uh, Pivotal Weather site and I'll just play the clip here. Um, so you can see, you know, there is smoke, right? It gives the concentration. There is still smoke here, uh, but it's a lot less at the moment than, you know, the weather patterns are such that uh, it's still kind of coming down this way a bit, but not so much. I mean, it's coming up here and spreading. It, we don't have that really sharp low pressure over here, which creates a counter, uh, counterclockwise flow, which creates a north to south flow, which drove all the smoke down in past Ottawa, down into the major US cities, um, concentrated it in the case of New York. Okay, so that's also very useful site uh, pivotal weather hrr you can hrrr you, or you can just google pivotal weather near surf smoke density or whatever and then you know come to this site fairly quickly okay so i kind of focused a little bit on the science um as to what is um you know this is what climate change looks like 
climate change is um, the confluence of factors from climate change caused this terrible weather. And I went through this article and there were two links in this article. Um, one of them uh, is, uh, where is it? I go down more. Um, there was a recent study that had uh, a global look at the potential changes in fire weather this century using the Canadian Fire Weather Index. And it suggested the average fire duration could triple, average fire intensity could jump by 31% for uh, a, a higher end amount of global warming, 3% above pre-industrial. And there was also another link, fairly recent study done in the, on, in the US. Okay, so I'll look at those studies next. So, okay, so this is the US one, wildfire weather analyzing the 50 year shift across America. Okay, so, and you, I think you probably intuitively know a lot of these things, but, you know, of course, climate change is worsening wildfires across the U.S., many other places too, puts more people at risk. The, the heat trapping pollution, the greenhouse gases affect the weather conditions, cause the warming, which affects weather conditions, increasing the risk of wildfire. Long-term warming trends are drying out forests, grasslands and other landscapes. They help fires spread and they hinder the opportunities to fight and prevent them. The fires are born, burning more intensely. They're moving faster, depending on the winds and the terrain. And uh, they're also, um, they're, they're lasting for much longer. The, the fire season is extended on both ends significantly. And some of the major biggest fires, they only go out um, when we turn into the fall um, and weather conditions change. But if they're starting much earlier, if they're starting in June, May and June, rather than in July and August, then they'll be burning for that much longer. Okay, so Climate Central looked at historical trends in fire weather. So what we mean by fire weather it's a combination of high heat, low humidity, and strong winds. When you have uh, fire weather being favorable for fires, then all you need is ignition from lightning or human carelessness, or you know, human a spark inadvertently from humans, um, and the fuel. And we've had derechos and ice storms, which have brought down lots of trees. Also, you know, beetles have weakened trees, the bark beetle, the emerald ash borer. Okay, so the trees are less um, resilient to, to fires. And, you know, the, in the high north, it's mostly coniferous forests, it's forests as opposed to deciduous at lower latitudes. And coniferous burn a lot easier. And there's lots of oils in the pine needles and in the tree itself, saps and things that are very, very volatile. They, they, they also, they, they're very, very flammable or inflammable. It means the same thing, right? Flammable, inflammable, <laughs> crazy. Anyway, the analysis was from 476 weather stations. They looked at trends in 245 climate divisions spanning the contiguous US during a 50 year period from 1973 to 2022. Wildfire seasons are lengthening. That's what the data shows. They're also intensifying. Uh, particularly during spring and summer in the West. Parts of Southern California and the Southwest are seeing around two additional months of fire weather compared to the early 1970s, okay? So two additional months. Annual fire weather days are increasing in many parts of the East as well, although by fewer days on average than in the West. But even these smaller increases can be impactful impactful in the densely populated east. There's more people and property exposed. Seasonal trends are emerging in the east with many areas, ex areas experiencing more fire weather days during the spring. Of course, differences in climate, topography, land use, and population distribution mean that wildfire risks are regionally distinct. They're, they're, they're different in different places. 
but fire weather isn't limited to the western U.S. All U.S. regions experience conditions that increase the likelihood of more extreme fires. So as the fire weather occurs more frequently, the risk gets higher. Communities across the country must adapt to live with more frequent fire weather and the associated risks. So this is uh, interesting. In the U.S., it says humans caused nearly 90% of wildfires between 2018 and 2022. That's in the U.S. Now, I thought the numbers were closer to about 50-50, you know, half caused by humans, half caused by lightning. And lightning is increasing 12%. For every degree of warming we get, it increases 12%. And I'll show you a little, you know, a little reference to a paper on that. That paper is from is is about uh, you know almost a decade from a decade ago I think it's from 2014. Okay, uh, but I guess people are more and more careless. Uh, people aren't only responsible for igniting wildfires. Human activity influences the weather and environmental conditions that increase the likelihood that wild wildfires will start and spread. At least two thirds of the rapid increase in fire weather in the Western U.S. in recent decades is can be attributed to human caused climate change. So there's climate attribution studies that show this. Um, the IPCC, they report um, their projections are for more frequent fire weather conditions with increased warming. Once a fire is lit, three main factors influence its behavior, the weather, the fuels, the state of the fuels and the topography. Changes to weather can affect fire behavior and increase fire risk, regardless of the nature of the fuels present or the natural contours of the land or the topography. Okay, so fire weather it refers to meteorological conditions that promote the spread of wildfires. Uh, variables like temperature, relative humidity, wind, precipitation, and other atmospheric conditions all affect fire behavior. So what they're focusing on here is three climate fact three three meteorological conditions or factors relative humidity temperature and wind okay um, these conditions prime a landscape for wildfire when they converge in particular ways to be considered a fire weather day um, relative humidity okay is key it's a measure of how close the air is to saturation. So 100% relative humidity, the air is saturated and can no longer hold moisture. Okay, when the humidity is low, relative humidity is low, the air feels dry, it draws moisture from the land, leaving the vegetation parched and prone to burn. Okay, when the temperature increases, the relative humidity decreases. Now relative humidity is lowest during the afternoon when air temperatures are the highest. So that's the time to watch out. Um, hotter temperatures, of course, affect humidity and dryness. They can also have a direct influence on fire behavior because they heat the fuels and make them more likely to ignite. Now we used to have cooler nighttime temperatures and that historically meant lower risk of wildfires growing and spreading overnight. But as climate change brings warmer nighttime temperatures, fire weather conditions can extend into more hours of the day and in fact through the night and the so you know the fire doesn't sort of settle down at night it can be just as bad if the uh you know relative humidity is still very low and it's very hot and of course wind supplies oxygen to the fire causing it to burn more rapidly wind also increases evaporation helps to dry out the land which provides more fuel for the fire changes in wind speed or direction can cause a fire to shift can increase the rate of spread and intensity of the fire. And of course, the wind also carries embers and it can carry them many, many miles and start satellite fires uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the fire front. So how do scientists measure the dry conditions for risk of a fire? Well, they use this thing called vapor pressure deficit, VPD. It's similar to relative humidity. Um, it's another way to monitor surface dryness or aridity. The more water vapor in the air, the greater the pressure, the, va the, the vapor pressure of the water, the greater the difference between the vapor pressure and the vapor pressure at saturation, the greater the evaporation potential from the ground. So as VPD increases, as the deficit increases, 
meaning the air is further away from saturation, plants must draw more moisture from their roots, which could lead to plants drying out or dying. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, rather than talk about relative humidity, they often talk about vapor pressure deficit, just to explain what this is. So fire weather is an important precondition for wildfire, but you also need the ignition and you need, you know, it affects fire ignition, fire weather behavior and eventual suppression because it's a lot easier to ignite if the fire weather is favorable. So fuels are any combustible material that can feed a fire, whether it be grass, trees, leaves, or other vegetation. Increased rainfall during winter or spring can lead to more vegetation growth, which can then dry out during the heat of summer and increase the risk of wildfire. Okay, this is a big, huge big deal in, in California. You know, the very wet springs mean watch out in the summer when the stuff dries out. The spread of invasive grasses and other plants is creating more combustible and fire prone environments in many places because these invasive grasses and plants, they can grow where they're, they're very, they grow like weeds, literally. They grow super fast and can get, become very bulky and there's provide lots of fuel for fires. Climate change is impacting the amount of fuel in the landscapes. So in the mountain west, rising temperatures contribute to tree mortality by beetles. So there's a buildup of dead trees that leads to larger and worse wildfires. More intense storms driven by climate change, they blow down trees and create dead wood that becomes fuel for future fires. So the derecho we had a year ago in Ontario and Quebec uh, caused lots of trees to come down in Ontario and Quebec. and then, most of them are still there in the forests um, as fuel for fires. Um, and we had an ice storm in early May that took out 1.2 million, um, the power to 1.2 million people in Quebec and quite a few people in Ontario, not that as many as Quebec, but that brought down a lot of branches and trees, which is also fuel for, for these existing fires now. You know, of course, droughts contribute to the drying of fuels and in, increase in fire activity. Um, climate change is a major contributor to severe and persistent droughts in southwestern North America in recent decades. Um, there's very limited ground moisture to evaporate in the atmosphere, so warmer temperatures dry out the air, sometimes called hot droughts. So if there's any ve vegetation in place, like leaves, brush, or dead trees, that increases the risk of intense fires. And often, you know, we get dry lightning, that's lightning from the cloud to the ground, and it occurs without any accompanying rainfall. And this is the most likely type, obviously, to cause wildland fires, because if it's lightning in a rainstorm, then the rain is doing quenching of, of the fire. And topography is also very important. It can cause dramatic shifts in fire behavior. The slope steepness and direction of the fire, the elevation barriers and land configuration all play a role. Okay, so if the wind's blowing up slope and you've got a fire, then watch out. You know, or if the wind's blowing down slope and you've got a fire on that down slope, then watch out. Although going up slope is, uh, it'll be burning quicker. If you just think about where the heat is going, you can see, figure, figure that out, see that. So the fire weather trends were analyzed um, in, uh, you know, from 476 weather stations, 245 climate divisions, and 48 contiguous U.S. states from 1973 to 2022, the data. And some of the results, uh, the contiguous U.S. is 2.5 Fahrenheit warmer today than it was in 1970. So warming, that influences fire weather has been observed across the country. But key regional climate differences spanning from the west to east broadly translate in distinct fire weather trends. So the east generally experiences <coughs> a more humid heat because it's warm ocean currents and moisture blown, blown in from the Gulf of Mexico. The west typically experiences dry heat as in low humidity, which is more favorable for fire weather because cool coastal currents do not contribute as much moisture to the air as warmer water. Okay, um, th there's decreasing relative humidity. That's a major factor in boosting annual fire weather days across many parts of the US, drier conditions, and the seasonality of fire weather trends also differs. 
The West has seen the greatest jump in fire weather days in the summer, particularly in the Southwest, while the East is experiencing a greater uptick in fire weather during the spring. So here's, uh, this is a change in days um, across the U.S. in terms of, so dryness meets uh, thresholds um, for, for fire weather. Um, temperature, when temperature exceeds 45 to 55, that exceeds uh, the threshold, and this is a change of days in, um, in which you exceed, meet or exceed the uh, fire weather for this parameter. And this is the wind speed, um, actually fa um, ex go getting faster here and exceeding threshold, actually some, so a little bit slower up here, which is interesting. Okay, so long term, so in the West, the Southwest experiences nearly two more months of fire weather days each year on average. Um, so long term, Warming trends are accelerating evaporation from soils and plants, making drier conditions. This drying has been driving increases in the frequency of fire weather days. Um, there's been a strong increase in the, since the 1970s in the average number of annual fire weather days. Um, and you can see what the greatest increases are in Southern California, Texas, and New Mexico. Some areas are seeing around two more months of fire weather compared to a half century ago. And uh, some places are getting fire weather more than twice as often now than in the early 70s. Uh, it, the, the western interior regions are uh, getting much greater increases in fire weather days in the western coastal regions. So if you live along the coast, it generally means higher humidity levels. No surprise there. Okay, so um, so here's some of the uh, you know groups uh, data um, from the different regions, and this is the average annual fire weather days, and this is the average change how how it's increased since 1970, um, and also households in the wildland urban interface. So these are houselands uh, that are you know, if, that are next to trees, and if the trees burn, that can go into the urban region. So this is the average annual fire weather days out west in the U.S. and the change. So b the biggest increases are in the southwest regions. And there's some more data in different states, uh, average annual fire weather days and the average change. So huge changes, uh, you know, in some of these, some of these regions. And then in the east, um, parts of the southeast experience several weeks of fire weather on average each year. Northern Florida gets about a month. The, this at-risk band roughly aligns with the most populated corridors along the east coast, demonstrating how increasing fire weather days could put more people at risk in the region. Okay, now of course this doesn't apply to the smoke because the fires were in Canada and that's the smoke that was carried um, but this is, it's useful to know that the risks are of fires on the East Coast that would greatly impact populated corridors on the East Coast of the U.S. are, are, uh, are happening. It's a higher risk. Um, okay, so, so there's, and then they go to, they, they talk a lot about the regional. So this is the uh, East Coast, the average annual fire weather days. Um, and the change in the number of days. Um, so it breaks it down again into all the regions. And of course, why does fire weather matter? As it becomes more prevalent, there are more days when extreme conditions can blow up small blazes into big ones or fuel the continued growth of large wildfires. Okay, many communities in the U.S. are accustomed to living with wildfire risks, but they're dealing with more frequent fire weather. The increase in fire weather days, it brings novel risks for which they may be unprepared. So there's more people and property at risk because urbanization and the development of forests, forest edges, and other areas where fires are prone to burn, known as the wildland urban interface, it puts more residents in harm's way. It forces firefighting agencies to allocate greater resources towards protecting homes as opposed to putting out the fires. Uh, between 1990 and 2020, land that falls within the delineated 
Wild and urban interface zones is expanded from about 7% of the total area in the continental U.S. to about 9%. This is quite a large increase. So there's a lot more houses near forests. California contains the most households in the wildlife urban interface, 5.1 million. But most of the WUI is in the east. Nearly 80% of the WUI lands, as well as more than 60% of WUI households are in the eastern states. The southeast has 810.6 million alone. Okay, um, three of the top states with the greatest number of households in the wild and urban interface also saw an increase in fire weather days. That was California, Texas, and North Carolina. The increase of human activity in forested or dry areas, it causes more wildfire ignitions, including at times of year when lightning is uncommon and fires would naturally be rare. And the percentage of human caused wildfires, it's grown during the past two decades. It's a very, very bad trend. And of course, wildfires are very costly. The 2022 Western wildfire season caused about 3.2 billion in damages. Fire suppression efforts cost federal agencies about 4.4 billion in 2021. So we're talking huge things. This is the number of households in the wild and urban interface in 2020. So, you know, lots in California, lots in Texas, here's Florida, and some of the eastern states. And uh, fire weather conditions, they restrict the ability of firefighters to manage and put out wildfires. With climate change, Nights have warmed significantly, even more so than days. This has decreased the overnight relative humidity that once helped firefighters gain control over wildfires. Okay, uh, so as there's larger and more numerous fires, the resources of the firefighters are stretched thin, forcing difficult decisions about responding to some fires while, while allowing others to burn unchecked. And of course, smoke. Smoke is a dangerous pollutant, can contribute to a variety of health problems, including exacerbating asthma symptoms, increasing susceptibility to some viruses like influenza or COVID-19. So good job this, um, all this smoke didn't happen a few years ago when COVID was just getting going because it would have exacerbated uh, the number of people catching COVID. Right, anything that harms the lungs and weakens it makes it more uh, makes us less resilient to the um, to the effect. Um, smoke exposure poses especially high risk to those with other health problems, particularly among seniors and others with weakened lung health. And of course, it's not isolated to areas near a wildfire. Large fires in the West or in Canada can affect air quality from coast to coast. And prescribed burning is when you, um, the, the con weather conditions that are favorable for prescribed burning, you know, controlled fires burning, when you know the fire can't spread, um, those time periods are less and less. So they're having to do more prescribed burning at the same time and that harms the air as well. Um, planned power outages, okay, in California, they have these you know, when the winds are high and the fire risk is high, to, they try to avoid ignitions of the fire from downed power lines and other equipment. Um, remember a few years ago, the downed power, power lines, I think, started the fires, which then went through paradise um, in California. Um, so they call these public safety power shutoffs. Um, but these also create health risks to those who depend on power for refrigeration and medications and to stay cool during heat waves. So the wildfire related PSPSs in California in 2019 had an estimated economic impact of about 10 billion. Okay, so how do we adapt to more frequent fire weather? Um, you know, land use management techniques to eliminate excessive fuels like prescribed burns thinning of small trees, creating defensible space around homes and other structures, allowing small fires to burn themselves out when it's safe to do so. So adaptation to more fire weather in a warming world is critical. Um, okay, reducing carbon pollution is, is essential. Okay, and uh, yeah, so they go a little bit more into the methodology and stuff. But anyway, it's an excellent paper um, and I'm just going to mention some other things and these these are accessible 
Um, there was a paper back uh, a while back in, in 2021 that was talking about the dominance of wildfires impact on air quality exceedances during the 2020 record-breaking wildfire season in the U.S. Okay, so there was a record-breaking wildfire season in the U.S. in 2020. Um, and uh, we'll just look at the abstract. So this basically looks at the PM 2.5 particles with and without the fire. Um, during August to October of 2020, Western wildfires contributed 23% of surface PM 2.5 in the contiguous U.S., 43% on the Pacific coast and mountain region, 42%. You know, it peaked on September 14th, 2020, uh, when 273 air quality exceedances were recorded and the wildfire contributed 41%, 81%, and 72% to surface PM 2.5 concentrations in the um, contiguous U.S., the Pacific Coast, and the mountain region, specifically. Okay, so, you know, it goes through, um, if you want to find out a bit more about this, you can see the passage of the smoke, etc., um, but that was from a few years ago. I just wanted to point out that paper. Uh, this is human-caused wildfires uh, by geographic area. So 2022, look at that, 61,429. Uh, if you look at the number of human-caused wildfires over time, um, it was this is the peak in 2017. Um, there's an even higher peak in 2021. Right, some. I mean, the numbers are, are the numbers are scattered, and this is the human-caused acres burned. Um, so acres burned due to humans. Really large here. Right, this is human-caused fires. So, you know, this is uh, some interesting data here, um, and some wildfire statistics. Uh, Congressional Research Service. Um, they talk about 193 million acres of the National Forest System. Um, Department of Inter that's the Forest Service within the U.S. Department of Agriculture carries out management and response across 193 million acres. Department of the Interior manages more than 400 million acres. And you can look at some of the since 2000, the average, an annual average of 70,025 wildfires have burned an average, annual average of 7 million acres. That's about, uh, um, that's about uh, 2.8 million hectares, something like that. Um, you know, it gives the number of fires, um, and federal, non-federal, total number of fires, okay, across the year. And the acres burned, 8.8, 4.7 million acres, and so on. So it just gives some stats. Top five years with largest wildfire acreage burned since 1960. They're all, they're all fairly recent, um, fairly recent years. You know, 10.13 was the record in, in 2015. Uh, and then who owns the land and structures burned, percentage of structures burned, percentage of residences burned out of the total structures, about half, right? Super conflagrations, et cetera. So there's some interesting uh, data there. I'm just showing you this, uh, you know, in case you haven't seen it. Um, Projected increase in lightning strikes in the U.S. due to global warming. Um, basically, this was a paper back in 2014. Lightning occurs more frequently when it's hotter than when it's colder, but how much more would you expect as global temperatures increase? Currently, there are about 25 million lightning strikes per year. That was in 2014. Um, 
So the, a proxy was based on the energy available to make air rise in the atmosphere on, on precipitation rates to model the frequent, were used as proxies to model the frequency of lightning strikes across the continental US. And they predicted that the number of lightning strikes will increase by about 12% for every degree of rise in global air temperature. So, um, you know, it talks about the convective available potential energy, uh, precipitation rate. Uh, um, they use 11 climate models and they got the 12% increase um, per degree of Celsius of global warming. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's, that's where I got that number from. So there are more lightning strikes. So I guess it's a race, you know, if the, if we get enough warming, then the lightning strikes will, it change. So that ratio of fires caused by lightning versus humans, uh, you know, is, is going to have some variance. Now I've got a lot of other stuff to cover here. So I'm gonna have to speed it up a little bit. So I'm not gonna talk in detail about this paper, but there's a fire weather index um, and they, they look at what will, they project uh, the, what will happen with warming in the future. So I'm just gonna talk about the, some of the key finding of the paper that you know, human-induced climate change is increasing the incidence of fire events and impacts on livelihood, biodiversity, and nature across the world. This is, by the way, published uh, May 30th, 2023. So it's a very recent paper on, on it's a very detailed paper on, on fires. Um, so, they talk. They use the Canadian Weather Fire Weather Index (FWI) and they simulate in the latest computer models the C CMIP six, which is coupled model intercomparison project. Okay, so what do they find out? We find that at a global warming level of three degrees Celsius, the mean fire weather would increase on average by at least two-thirds, 66% in duration and frequency. So we'd have more fires, the fires would last longer, um, while associated one in 10 year events would approximately triple in duration and increase by at least 31% in intensity. Okay, so those are significant changes expected. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a detailed paper um, I'm not going to go in, you know, these are some of the different model runs and, you know, basically we've got temperature, we've got wind, we've got relative humidity, and we've got rain. Um, and, uh, you know, there are the interconnections between them and, and, uh, the fires and the fire weather index, okay, can be calculated. So they do the statistics and they look at the soils and the dryness and, so on and they get the uh they they get they get basically the areas that are most prone to fires so you know look here we go fire weather index here down here you know in in europe india interestingly not they don't show a lot of fires up here and then in northern australia also okay so they do a lot of protect projections and analysis i mean i may I may cover this paper separately in in detail. I haven't decided yet. I'll uh, have to, I'll have to reread the whole thing again and make a decision on that. But you know, we've talked about the fires in Canada and the effect on of smoke on Canada and the U.S. But I just want to show you Siberia's sweltering in record-breaking temperatures amid the worst heat wave in history. This was uh, from June eighth. This article and it shows you. The, this is a two meter temperature anomaly, very high in Northern Canada, all the way up. But also look at the, the, the temperatures in, in Asia, huge temperatures in age, Asia. So dozens, they've had dozens of heat records falling in Siberia. Temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 37.7 Celsius. Still only early June, but records are tumbling. Extreme heat's pushing into very, very high latitudes, and you can see it going right up to the Arctic here. Uh, 37.9 in the city Jalturovska, hottest day in history. Um, and then 39.6 here, 38.5 
Uh, you know, some of these stations have about five to seven decades of temperature readings, and they're, they're being broken, they're being, they're being crushed. It's the region's worst heat wave in history is going on, and it looks to get worse. Records keep falling today with the gain temperatures around 40 Celsius. Brutally hot day in Asia with 47 C in China and 39 C in Siberia. You know, uh, India, India Highlands 29.9. You know, so I didn't want to do that. Let's go back here. Okay, um, they talked about a pro an intense and prolonged heat wave in 2020, which saw the Arctic Siberian town of Verk. Koyansk hit 100.4 degrees Celsius, 38 Celsius, which would have been impossible without human-caused climate change, according to the climate um, attribution people. Siberia is one of the fastest warming regions of the planet, with hot extremes increasing in intensity. Um, and then, of course, wildfires raging in parts of Russia have left at least 21 people dead. Right, wildfire season is taking hold in the Northern Hemisphere along with Canada. Um, and Siberia along with Canada has been grappling with significant and intense wildfires. And then they talk about the fire that killed at least 21 people in the Ural Mountains. It's not just Siberia that's seen record heat this week, it spread across Central Asia. 42 degrees, um, Turkmenistan was a world record rolling heat waves, historic heat waves, which is rewriting world climate history, okay? So this is Siberia. And uh, that's just the tweet. Now the wildfires, this is wildfires. This is from a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, in Russia's Ural Mountains, there's an image, killed at least 21 people, hospitalized several others. Um, more than 80 fires were active over an area of 113,500 hectares, 280,000 acres, 800 residents evacuated. Um, the European Union's Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, okay, so satellite detection, showed that the seasonal fire activity started in the region in April, but is ramped up this month. The scale and intensity of the current fires are reflecting increased fire risk following some weeks of drier than usual conditions. Okay, um, Russia has been experiencing wildfires that are more intense and more frequent. In 2021, fires burned through 18.8 .8 million hectares or 46 million acres of forest as temperatures in Siberia soared, according to Greenpeace Russia. There you go. And uh, if you just go to Climate Reanalyzer and look at the two meter anomaly, we can see North America, very warm temperatures. Um, this is in the Amazon and in the rainforests. You know, warm temperatures up here. There's boreal forests there and also very warm temperatures um, back in Asia. So look at these temperatures going right up to the Arctic Circle or right up to the Arctic Ocean rather in, uh, in, in Asia. So and temperatures in Australia and look, look at the anomaly in uh, Antarctica, crazy. I mean, the temperature 2.53 degrees warmer than, than normal in Antarctica, but at least there's no fires, no wood that can burn there. It's just the ice melting. There you go, gotta look on the bright side. Okay. Um, CAMS, this is a Copernicus, European, the Atmospheric Monitoring Service, and they have an article on June 1st, um, and they talked about the Northern Hemisphere getting significant wildfire activity in April and May, very large wildfires in Canada across Eurasia. So they monitor it, and this is a little, this is a bulletin. Um, so back in April, they said that uh, temperatures in northern Canada were warmer than average and the so soils were drier, so the conditions were conducive to a large scale of wildfire activity in the region. Since May 4th, a number of large wildfires started in the province of Alberta. Okay, so Alberta was first, 61 active fires in Saskatchewan. And then, uh, you know, British Columbia also. So this is British Columbia, the dates back in May, Alberta and Saskatchewan. 
and the axis is total fire radiative power, which is an indication of the strength of, it's, it's the number of fires, just how large they are, the strength of them, it's all in this total radiative power coming from fire. Carbon emissions from, from uh, these provinces in, in that time period. And then there was the East Coast that was hit, okay, and Nova Scotia. Thousands of people forced from their homes with more than 20,000 hectares burning, 13 active wildfires, the one right next to Halifax, and then Ontario, Northern Ontario fires. So this is the Northwest radiative power. Uh, this is towards the end of May from Northwest Territories, Ontario, Nova Scotia. And then um, comes, uh, you know, the Quebec, Quebec fires after, but this was from June 1st. Okay, so this was before the smoke event, so they showed the total fire radiative power from for the month of May across Canada, so mostly in the west. They also said that there was significant activity in Russia, so they monitor it in Russia. According to Russia's Aerial Forest Protection Service, as of May 31st, firefighters were battling 55 active fires. Um, Second wave of fires is expected in July, August. So the, here's here's the radiative power from uh, the uh, you know the Russia fires, and then the uh, carbon emissions coming from there. And there's some more data on well on on the uh, Russian uh, radiative power from the fires and the uh, emissions. Carbon, carbon emitted. So very useful data from, that's just to remind you from Copernicus CAMS monitoring Northern Hemisphere wildfire activity. And then of course the smoke um, has reached as far as Norway from Canada. So you can see the smoke here and it's come across uh, to, uh, you know, here it's come across and it's reaching Norway. Okay, uh, the smoke from hundreds of wildfires burning in Canada, which already blanketed parts of the US and placed around 75 million people under air quality alerts. It's reached Norway, so the plumes have gone all the way across. People in Norway may be able to smell and even notice the smoke as a light haze, but should experience no health problems because it's very diluted. Okay, the, the, the plume has spread across swaths of Europe, but um, it's diluted. Um, and in, it's not unusual, like in 2020, smoke from California's record-breaking wildfires was detected in Svalbard. Um, but of course, if it goes up to the Arctic, it can darken the surface and cause feedback. It's interesting, this CNN article, it says the Arctic is already warming about four times faster than the rest of the world. Um, okay, uh, most, most people don't say that yet. Although, you know, it's good, it's accurate reporting. Now, impact of air pollution on life expectancy. So in 2019, air pollution shortened the average life expectancy by one year and eight months. This is globally, okay? Many factors can lead to poor health and reduce life expectancy. Air pollution is one of them. Currently, air pollution is the fourth leading cause of death globally, accounting for nearly 7 million deaths. Now, I've seen it reported as high as 10 million deaths. Um, so current levels of air pollution have reduced life expectancy by one year and eight months on average worldwide. Considered separately in 2019, ambient fine particulate matter, the PM 2.5 reduced life expectancy by one year. Household air pollution, so indoor air pollution by 0 0.7 year and ambient ozone by by about 0 0.1 arrest, 0 0.07. And air pollution reduces average life expectancy by almost as much as tobacco use. So here is the life expectancy reduced from tobacco, dietary, smoking, you know, air pollution is next. And this is the PM 2.5 chunk, this is household chunk, and this is the ozone chunk. High fasting, plasma glucose, unsafe, wash, unsafe sex, secondhand smoke, occupational. So secondhand smoke is, is significant too. 
Okay, and then and then it goes through disparities, uh, years lost in different regions, and so on. Um, okay, so that's interesting. And then, air, you know, there's this article, air pollution slashing 10 years of, of life expectancy in Delhi, the world's most polluted city. Okay, so air pollution, you know, your life expectancy if you live in Delhi is shorter by about 10 years. Um, despite COVID-19 lockdown slowing economic activity since 2020, a new study by a U.S. research group shows New Delhi, India's capital, has been ranked the world's most polluted city where people have lost almost 10 years of their lives to air pollution. Um, across the country of India, it's five years. Bangladesh, Bangladesh is the world's most polluted country overall, followed by India, Nepal, and Pakistan. People living in Bangladesh's capital, Dhaka, are losing nearly nine years of their lives to air pollution. The national average for Bangladesh is 6.9 years. Okay, and they talk about the Air Quality Index and the World Health Organization guideline for annual average particulate pollution of five micrograms per cubic meter. Okay, because that's the most dangerous air pollution, those PM. 2.5, Delhi is more than 10 times the safe limit. See, the problem is these PM 2.5 particles, they can penetrate and settle deep in the lungs, causing severe health issues, including respiratory and heart diseases. They can actually cross the barrier, they go into the blood. More than 500 million people who live in Northern India are on track to lose 7.6 years of their lives. So it's very alarming. Um, Right, and it goes on with some more details. Um, yeah, here, this, I love this. It would be a global emergency if Martians came to Earth and sprayed a substance that caused the average person on the planet to lose more than two years of life expectancy, right? <laughs> but, you know, that's what we're doing with our air. Okay, so that's very interesting. Uh, now, yeah, I gotta, okay, so I'm gonna finish up, I think, soon with cigarettes. So PM 2.5, um, you know, how bad is it for human health, okay? So you can look at it in terms of cigarettes. One cigarette per day. So Berkeley Earth, these are their findings. Um, one cigarette per day is equivalent to 22 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5. Okay, so there you go. Okay, so when Ottawa hit 511 for the day, uh, last Wednesday, that's about 23 cigarettes. So that's like smoking a pack. What are the worst places in the world? Well, here's Vancouver. Vancouver is pretty good air. Uh, but they showed, you know, they showed, uh, this is a very interesting map showing the number of cigarettes equivalent that you would smoke for the air quality of the region that you're in. So Vancouverites indirectly smoke um, 50, 59 cigarettes a year just by breathing air. Uh, okay, smoking one cigarette per day is a rough equivalent of a PM 2.5 level of 22. Okay, so if you live in um, Vancouver and somebody asks you if you smoke, even if you don't smoke, you should say yes about, uh, about you know, about a cigarette a week because <laughs> I'm breathing the air in the city. Okay, so here's uh, how many cigarettes you're indirectly smoking in major Canadian cities each year. So Montreal, 124. Montreal's got the worst air quality. Then Windsor, then Hamilton. We've got Kitchener and Ottawa. I'm surprised Ottawa is so high on the list here. How can Toronto be less than Ottawa? I don't know. Um, Vancouver is low. Okay, so do we want to delve into this a bit more? Well, here we go. Air pollution and cigarette equivalent. This is by Berkeley Earth. So they show the air pollution and they show the US average, you know, China average, different places. Um, so one cigarette is equivalent to an air pollution of 22 micrograms per cubic meter for one day. The average PM 2.5 in Beijing over the years about 85, equivalent to four cigarettes per day. 
The average value in the industrial city of Handan, about 200 kilometers south of Beijing, is 120 micrograms per meter cube. That's 5.5 cigarettes a day. Um, in Harbin, the air pollution reached a limit 999. This is 45 cigarettes per day. New Delhi, um, 25 cigarettes a day. Here, a recent peak reported in the Washington Post by the city of Shenyang in China set a new record of 1,400 micrograms per cubic meter, equivalent to over three packs of cigarettes per day for every man, woman, and child living there. Okay, so this is, why is this a useful comparison? Because people understand, you know, a pack smoking a cigarette or a pack. It also shows that if you're a smoker, it doesn't, you don't need to worry about wildfires because you're getting all of that. I just wanted to finish up by saying that, uh, you know, we, we did a video with the Climate Emergency Forum, Canada on Fire, um, and I highly recommend that you that you watch it. We talked about a lot of different things about the fires and, and what, what's happening. So it's uh, Re Regina, this is Regina, and there's Peter Carter and myself uh, discussing the fires in Canada, etc. So make sure you subscribe and watch the Climate Emergency Forum videos. Okay, well, thanks again for listening, and uh, please remember to uh, donate to my PayPal account on my website, paulbeckwith.net, to support my research and videos. Thanks again, and bye for now.